All right. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, Joe. Joe Thompson. Um, nice to see y'all. Just in case you're wondering, I've dressed up for All-Star Weekend. <laughs> and it is the theme of the night when it comes to Bob's presentation. Stay tuned. Um, what is this? Are you part of this? Are you? I don't know. I'm, I'm the uh, chapter president <laughs> of this chapter. Thank you. My agent, uh, Mike, likes to uh, keep me in line. But uh, everybody knows the Bad News Bears numbers. You know who this is? Can y'all guess? Okay. Number three. Nobody knows that. Kelly Lee. Nobody has seen Bad News Bears in here. Come on. <laughs> huh? That's not one of the greatest baseball movies ever. <laughs> anyway, well, I like it, and I guess that's all that. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So um, we added a new member this month, all the way from Latvia, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. Pietro Striano. Pietro, my maybe the hour difference. Speed one, one, one. All right, maybe that has something to do with it. So, yeah. So uh, maybe Pietro, watch, watch this corny. So, thanks again for all of you who came last month to hear Arlene Lassie. I got a lot of uh, good feedback for that. Uh, quite a few of you were really impressed. Uh, was at the Yankee game the other day. Uh, John Lloyd came up and said he really enjoyed that presentation. So, um, so uh, she wrote a book, of course, the very best of the hot flashes essays that will warm your heart. She was oh, a yeah. she was part of the uh, hot pants Philly patrol. So uh, give it a look. Pretty interesting book. Uh, a couple things real fast regarding the Astros. Uh, in case you don't know, the draft's been going on. There's a lot of stuff online about that first pick. Drew Gilbert from Tennessee. Uh, I heard a lot of stuff from MLB Network. Uh, hopefully somebody can kind of ring that guy in a little bit. Bring him in. You know, he's kind of a uh, wild child kind of player. Some people said online he wasn't happy when he got drafted by the Astros. But I, I watched the replay. The kid looked happy to me. So uh, he's an excitable guy. Um uh, we, we also drafted Jacob Melton from Oregon State and Andrew Taylor from Central Michigan and some more players, but I just wrote down the top three. Brian McTaggart, he had a tweet earlier today that said Astros are, quote, going up the middle with college players so far. Center field, center field, right-hand pitcher, right-hand pitcher, left-hand pitcher, right-hand pitcher, center, and right-hand pitcher. <laughs> so I don't know what they did after that. Um, also. From Brian in a tweet yesterday. In, in case you haven't been paying attention, Astros closer Ryan Presley thrown the he said has thrown the equivalent to a perfect game by retiring 27 consecutive batters from June 25th to today. So he tied, and I don't want to destroy his last name, Dave Gusty Justy from 1965 for the club record for consecutive backer batters retired by a reliever. Anybody know the uh, MLB record? Addicts with oil inning. What? First shot? Yes, Mirio Petit. You said a parking guy? No, no. Uh, retiring consecutive batters in a row. Oh. Perfect. Yes, Mirio Petit, 2014, reached 46, 46 consecutive batters in a row, and he broke Mark Burley's record of 45. Wow. So, uh, Presley has, what, 18 more to go? 19? What's that? The Giants. Is Mario Petit? He's tired. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. So, what year was it? Um, the article was from August 28, 2014. During the World Series. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. All right. Um, it's All-Star Week, of course. See how uh, excited everybody is about the All-Star game. 
And yeah, yeah, Altoon fades out, right? Verlander's not going to pitch, right? And uh, you're done. He's out too. So I heard that at the Futures game yesterday, the Dodgers fans very happy about any Astro that showed up. Shocking. Shocking. People are just like, what the? Come on, LA. <laughs> so, yeah, interesting. So, and Juan Soto, where he's going to end up? Do we think he's going to end up here? No. No. New York. New York and LA. So, San Diego. San Diego. <laughs> um, who's going to the convention next month? I, I'm going. There's the four or five of us. Yeah, Maxwell, David, you are going to do presentation. Love y'all. So we'll see y'all next month. Uh, here in the chapter, we're planning a uh, trip on Saturday to go see Aberdeen play Asheville. Uh, we're going to rent a car and go up there Saturday, watch that game. So uh, it's pretty neat. And one final thing just make sure you have your vaccination. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think it's Cal Ripken Field. Think so. Yeah. So, um, still looking for somebody to take over for Marsha to be recording secretary. Like I said, I, I usually do a lot of the stuff and just need people to take a few notes. That's all. So, that's it. So, Bob Stevens. Bob Stevens. Really, Bob. <laughs> 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 um, Mike, would you like to say something about the game, or you want me to? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Mike has set up another Space Cowboy game. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so since uh, a lot of the guys are going up to Baltimore, we were looking to have another Space Cowboy, Space Cowboy, outing at the... Uh, in Sugar Land, and there are two weeks at their home. The latter week in August, and this would be our meeting, uh, the Astros are home. The first week they're there, which is like the fifth through the seventh, the Astros have a Monday two home game, and then they're on the boat. They can go to Boston. So, we need to vote if we want to go. We need 20. And then we can pick a day <laughs> Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They are going to. What are the dates? I'm sorry. The dates that the after the month ran during the month? Now, August 6th, 7th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 10th, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <clears throat> I think they. 5th is a Friday. Yeah, August 6th is a Saturday. Monday and Tuesday of that week. Minor leagues play now Monday through Sunday. They play the same things. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Tuesday through Sunday. They play six games. So Monday and Tuesday, the Astros are home that week. And then I think they are home. Are they? Okay. So then it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, where there be no conflict or any Astro ticket holders. Following week, uh, two weeks later, Strows are home all week, so they're gone first. So, this, is there a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday present for anyone? I will say there's Friday night fireworks, and Saturday, Mike, would you be doing this in the suits again? Or yeah, $75 uh, ticket. We have 20 people and $3 parking. And playing the Round Rock again, Mike Katz, uh, I corresponded with him. He said he would meet with us again. He's got his book grinders out again. Buy his book, he'll autograph his book. Right. Whatever y'all are in. Minimum of 20 people? Minimum of 20 well, to get minimum. the discount. Yeah, 20 or more. 20. Yeah. Okay. Well, Brandon's going to wipe the time. I had to miss the last one after setting it up. Saturday night's a big night because it's uh 80s night, it's heavy Metallica, and they have the spasmodics doing a free concert after the game. 
across North America. Um, the person who sort of heads this up, John Racanelli, I'm going to try to get him to speak to us in September. Um, I think this will be a good thing uh, for the chapter. We have quite a few uh, ballpark locations that uh, we can help John locate, or at least uh, kind of Bob has volunteered to help with him. So, um, and speaking of September the 19th, um, Chris Rawls. Y'all know that name? Yeah. All right. Well, chapter, chapter member Jason Bristol did a uh, feature about Chris and his portable Houston baseball museum. Chris has agreed to be our speaker in September. And he will... Uh, he said he's going to make a game of some of the stuff he has. Uh, I thought it was unique. Probably when he, I think Jason asked him, what is it? What is your most unique thing you have from the history of baseball? He said he had a hot dog wrapper from the Astrodome. 
<laughs> it's a pristine condition. <laughs> so it'll I'll be uh, pretty excited to see what kind of stuff Chris uh, will come up with. Uh in September, the, that meeting will be September the 19th. Okay. Uh, Brian, you know? uh, probably not golf. He was in Richmond this last weekend. So oh. he's a member of the chapter. He said he had been able to come to meetings for the last uh, little while. Hopefully I can get him ordered. Uh Get back in, but he, you know, he left the Astros in October 2021. He worked in the front office as their tour coordinator, so it'll be pretty interesting to hear from him. So, um, finally, before we get to our guest chapter newsletter, we are looking for articles. Please send an article to Scott as fast as you can. Um, if you want to do anything. You know, 1922 related, since it's the 100 year anniversary or right. anything like that. Uh, I'm going to write something about the All Star game. Uh, get it to him as soon as possible. Uh, go ahead, Tony. Well, I just want to remind you in 1922, the Yankees were leading their, the American League. So more things have changed, more things have changed. Okay. Well, there you go. That's it. Fruit Bill 59. Yo, how many how many words How many words? Six hundred, Scott? Well, anywhere between two or two hundred and about anywhere between that. Sort of the better usually the work with the layout wise. Like that was in your mind, let it flow and send it. Yeah, we're looking to publish this uh first week of August. Right? So get your articles, boom, like now. <laughs> so all right. Um, David. Yes, Hello, sir. sir. How are you, David? Good. How are you? Just fine. David is the author of 1962. See the book right there. Baseball in America in the time of JFK. And he's also the author of uh, Our Bums, Brooklyn Dodgers in History, Memory, and Popular Culture. He is also the editor of the anthologies, the New York Mets in popular culture, and the New York Yankees in popular culture. And he's also the chair of the Elysian Field Club. David has also given a presentation at the uh, convention next month. Um, I'm looking forward to this. This is the 60-year uh, anniversary of the, the uh, Colt 45 slash Astros, and uh, he had a little bit about Houston in the book, so I thought I'd invite him to talk about his book from a Houston perspective. Also, so Dave, without further ado, it is all you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I want to talk about three things. I like to talk about the way the book came to be, the section on Houston specifically, and what I learned as a researcher. Uh, this book was born in a workshop. In New York, we have a continuing education school called Media Bistro. And it started as a way for people to network and get information about the media industry. And then it evolved into a place where you could have classes. And these were for people who wanted to further their writing endeavors. Uh, maybe they never wrote a book before, maybe they never wrote an article before, but it was a way for them to hone their craft. And I had taken the course in nonfiction book proposal uh, I did not know that you don't need to write a book to get it sold to an, to a publisher. You don't need to write a book to get it to an agent. I, I had no idea. Uh, but I took this class, and that's where the Dodgers book was born. So when I thought about retaking it, because I had such a great experience before, I said, 1962 is really interesting to me. I'm a Mets fan, so I know a little bit about Mets culture. I know a little bit about 1962. I've been reading about it and hearing about it ever since I was a little kid. I haven't read anything about the Cult 45s. I haven't seen any books. I haven't seen any scholarship. So my thought was to combine the two teams and write about that season. And that would take up 90% of the book, roughly 45% about the Mets, 45% about the Colt 45s, and then 10% everything else in the background. 
And I was really proud of myself. I thought no one's done this. I could get a lot of Houston fans like yourselves. And maybe I'll uncover some new scholarship about the Mets. So I go into the class and the instructor who is a literary agent said, I know you're a baseball guy from the last class and you congratulations on the Dodgers book, but books with broader topics get broader readerships. So think about it. And that night I walked, I, I, I came home, I took the path train home. The path train goes under the Hudson River from Manhattan to Jersey City, where I live. And I started Googling. And on the, on the train ride home, I had written some things down that I knew for sure happened in 62. I knew the Flintstones was on in the early 60s. I knew the Dick Van Dyke show was on in the early 60s. I knew To Kill a Mockingbird came out that year. I knew John Glenn went up in his capsule that year. I did not know that there were two other Mercury astronauts. I did not know that 1962, for my money, was the greatest year in movies. Some film scholars say 1939. I'll put 1962 against 1939 any day of the week and twice on Sunday. The Music Man, Lawrence of Arabia, That Touch of Mink, uh, Advice and Consent, the list goes on and on. And I Googled when I got home and I found maybe 40 or 50 different stories and subtopics. And I, I thought this is really rich. This is really rich. This cannot just be a baseball book. This has to encompass the entire year. So I went back to the class the next week and I said, I, I took what the instructor said to heart. Um, and this is what I came up with. I'd like to do a book that's half baseball, half popular culture, culture, history, uh, the arts, literature, movies, uh, NASA, JFK, and I'll intersperse it with the baseball. Now, how do you do that? Well, chronologically, it seemed to be impossible. So I figured every baseball topic would get a chapter. So there are five major teams that year. The Giants and Yankees are in the World Series. The Giants and Dodgers have a three-game playoff. So right there, that's three chapters, Dodgers, Giants, Yankees. And then you have the Mets and the Colt 45s, each with their own chapter. So that's five. And the World Series takes up half of October. The other half is the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I have some baseball in the beginning part of the book. So right there, it's roughly six chapters. And it's a, it's a pretty even split, 50% baseball and 50% everything else. And the, the instructor said, you will sell this one. When we got to the end of the class, after I did the summary and the outline and the table of contents and the sample chapter, and I felt really good about it. Now, how do you do the research? Well, fortunately for me, the Sabre conference was in Houston some time ago. And I had found out that the University of Houston houses George Kirksey's archives. Who is George Kirksey? George Kirksey is an unsung hero in Houston baseball. Kirksey was a public relations guy and he helped that team get off the ground yeah. as a concern, as an ongoing, legitimate, viable concern. The question was, do you have enough money? Well, Houston is laden with oil money. Then the question becomes, do you have enough of a fan base? The Buffaloes had a terrific, loyal fan base. Do you have enough to get to the major league level? Then the question becomes, do you have media projections? What will the television station be? What's the reach of the radio station? Do you have enough watts to blast the broadcasts beyond that which they are now? And Kirksey has all of this in the folders. So when I got to Sabre, I quietly took a cab in the morning. I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. I just left. I didn't go to any presentations or anything. And I went to the University of Houston 
a library where his archives are kept. There's a great archivist named Vince Lee who helped me tremendously. And I went through this unbelievably valuable resource. He had team newsletters. He had media projections, demographic projections, uh, things that every city has to do, every, uh, every concern that wants a baseball team. So in this case, it was the Houston Sports Association. And there were lists of the original owners, the, the minority owners. Now, one of my uh, pet peeves is that the two original owners of the Mets and the Colt 45s are not in the Hall of Fame. Joan Payson and Roy Hoffheins. Roy Hoffheins, as you all know, was really the passion behind this project. He was the face of the operation. And I learned quite a bit about him just by reading the memos and copying the newsletters and taking notes as you know, quickly as I could, and then asking Vince if I could get microfilm of the Houston newspapers because they're not online. They're not in any database. Uh, so we were able to get them through interlibrary loan at the New York Public Library. Uh, it, it was incredibly important to document Houston and New York because of the reason I said before, Houston had not really been uh, documented in a detailed way. So you'll see in the book, when I talk about the Houston team, I also summarize each player. And the way that we were able to do that was by going to the Hall of Fame and getting the player files. So I photocopied the files or what I thought was pertinent for each player of the five major teams that are chronicled. And Bob Aspermonte gave me an interview. Uh, he was a, a just tremendously open and honest. He loved Houston. He loved playing there, loved the people. There was I got a sense that Houston was really a small town in a big city that it's a very community oriented type of person who calls himself a Houstonian. Uh, so that was through my mind when I, when I was doing the research and doing the writing. Uh, so, you know, Roman Mejias and all these other great players are, are documented because in my mind, same thing with the Mets. The Mets were horrible, as you know, 40 and 120, but they deserve praise because it has to start somewhere. They have to start somewhere. The teams have to build on something. And for people in Houston with whom I spoke and people in New York with whom I spoke, uh, it was two sides of the same coin. Houstonians didn't see major league players. Not really, maybe if they were barnstorming or something like that. But now Colt 45's fans would get a chance to see Sandy Koufax and Willie Mays when they came to town. And in New York, the people who no longer had a team to root for because the Giants and the Dodgers had left after 57, they got to see the players they once rooted for, like Willie Mays and Drysdale and Koufax and so forth. Um, they also got a chance to see the other folks like Stan Musial and Bill Mazeroski and, and people from other teams that they couldn't see since 57 because for four years it was just the American League. 58, 59, 60, 61, the Yankees owned New York. Now the National League fans had a team. Um, so the, finally, what I'd like to talk about is what I learned as a researcher. 62 was so rich and so overflowing really with information because every time I thought I had something done, there was another book, there was another movie, there was another player, there was another article. And it got to the point where I never thought that I was going to get this done because I just kept growing and growing and growing. And you can write a book about any topic that's in there. You can write a book about the literature of 62, the movies of 62, baseball of 62. This was all combined into one. And what I did was I kept adding and I kept asking Nebraska, University of Nebraska Press, I kept asking for deadlines to be extended. Need more deadlines to be extended. I need another month. I need another two months. I need another three months. And they granted it. But it got to the point where I realized 
I, I can't do any more. This, this is it. And it was about 365 pages. So I handed it in and my editor got back to me. He said, great job. You have to cut it by 20%. So all the work I did was wasted or so I thought, because initially I figured, well, I did all that extra work. I could have stopped nine months ago and handed this in. So that was foolish of me. Not really, because some of the extra stuff I found was better than stuff I had originally. There were, there were stories and articles and interviews and you know, archival footage that I was able to find that I didn't have before I pushed myself. So it took a, about a day for me to realize, wait a minute, though that extra time really informed me and really gave me the freedom to pursue other avenues that I might not, not normally have gone down. Uh, one example being the Seattle World's Fair. That TV coverage is on YouTube. And people say the Kennedy assassination was really when TV news became, uh, came into its own, when it really grew as a medium those four days in 1963. Well, Seattle had people around the fair and they also had to report on a plane crash, a small plane crash in a neighborhood, a suburban neighborhood, I believe. Uh, and they had to report on that on the fly. So I think that was a real precursor to what TV news was going to become. And then other things, like I said, another movie to watch. And then I realized I can't watch every movie from 62. So I picked a handful. And for everyone who says I should have included Lawrence of Arabia, I'll say, well, I think advice and consent is pertinent as well. Be, it's, it, it's just the way it is. It's, a, it's no right, no wrong. It's just personal preference for the author. So uh, with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you all may have, and I'll answer to the best of my ability. And I thank you so much for your time. David, um, I think you had a momentous activity during uh, our convention of 2014. Um, you want to tell the folks about it? Oh, the, uh, uh, the first pitch? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, was that, you? That, that, <laughs> that, that was me. Um, I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> uh, what happened was I was sitting... You'll recall that there was a uh, there were tables where the uh, products, for lack of a better word, were lined up, and it was a silent auction. Well, where I come from, a silent auction is truly silent. You write your name, you write your dollar amount on an index card, and you put it into the box, and nobody sees. This way, everyone is able to see, and if they really want it, they could wait till the last second and outbid you by a dollar. So I looked over, I was at the bar area just reading the, the national pastime. And I looked over to where everyone was milling about. And I said, why, why are they spending money on things that are just going to be dust catchers? I mean, you, you all know, you, you, you buy a book, you buy a tchotchke, you buy a piece of memorabilia. And then five years later, you have to start cleaning things out. And I said, this is really silly. Why are they, why are they doing this? And why is somebody going to throw out the ball the first pitch? Why is somebody going to do that? And then after a couple of hours, I realized how much, how many times in your life do you get to do something like that? So that was really a present to myself to uh, to place the winning bid and and get out there on on the mound and it's it's scary and it's fun and it's exhilarating and i i highly recommend it it's an experience that i'll take with me oh dave i remember so well that you practiced throwing baseball inside hotel i practiced with, <laughs> with, 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 with jim cruz yeah, jim Bryce, and i think mike mccloskey also involved oh yeah okay yeah uh, it, it, it was uh yeah, I, I hadn't thrown that far in years. So if I, if I if I had to do it over, I might do it from I might do it from the lip of the mound. I might not go to the actual mound. 
I remember distinctly taking you down the field. That's right. Fish, and uh, he said, wow, that's a long way from the bow of the whole train. <laughs> so I, I suggest that maybe you throw the truck in front of that. You were right. You were absolutely right. And so you said, no, I'm going to do it right. I'm going to throw it in front if of the if I if I do it again, I'll probably take that advice. <laughs> I have to say something about that. Just a red ornament with minute donated the right for us to, for saver for that silent auction brought the first pitch, and he also gave us four seats up front. So you got the bid. I caught you out in the hotel. You practiced throwing, but it marked off 60 feet, so lobby threw to me. And then I went down when you were going to throw it out. And I got on the field to calm you down, and I realized I was the only guy out there without a press pass. <laughs> Just wandering around to make sure you did it well. Well, I, I the one thing that I was the most concerned about what I didn't know about the timing or how it worked or where I would be beforehand, the handlers and everything else. I, I made it a point to say to somebody, uh, I need to go to the store and get a, an Astros hat and an Astros t-shirt. I, I don't have anything. And they weren't selling them at the hotel. So I really, I need, I, I think I got a Nolan Ryan uh, t-shirt and an Astros hat. I got a, I got a question, David. Yes. So I am uh, uh, native Houstonian and uh, I was old enough to remember when the Colt 45s arrived uh, in 62. So uh, I'm sure there's a few other gentlemen here and maybe one lady here that remembers that as well. Uh, so of the, of the Colt 45s, any information that you found out? Pardon? Too young. Uh, I'm sorry, the Colt 45 information is there something that stands out to you uh, that's really kind of like kind of wow moment when you were studying the Colt 45? Anything really interesting that you might want to share with the group? Oh, the, the song. Uh, that's why I titled the chapter Shooting Shoot Him Down, Shooting Him Down. Uh, shoot Him Down, Houston Colt, Shoot Him Down. I, I, you know, that it was so resonant. And to get an orchestra to to do that and it, it was a great juxtaposition to meet the Mets which is very much fanfare you know lots of horns and everything else um and, and it, it there's something about music and baseball and that was so reflective of its time but because of the culture and the way it is you couldn't have a song like that you couldn't have an emblem like that but I I was really happy to find that song on YouTube um, and I, I think more than anything else, I, I couldn't really find too much about it, at least not as much as I found on the Mets song. Uh, but that's why I titled the, the chapter after the song. Thank you. What was the song? Shoot him down. Shoot him down. Shoot him down, Houston Colts. Shoot him down. <laughs> hey, David, uh, in yes. talking with some former players that played at the uh, outdoor stadium that the yeah. Colts had to play in. Yeah. One of the big factors besides the heat was the mosquito. Right. You might have in your research, I mean, I think it was Gaylord Perry I was talking to, and he just couldn't believe how bad the mosquitoes. Yeah, no, nobody had anything nice to say about Colt Stadium. The, the <laughs> mugginess, the, the mosquitoes, it, it looked like a nice facility in the pictures. Uh, but I, I soon came to understand and appreciate why the Astrodome was such a uh, revered facility uh, because of that. And I, I had a boss once who told me that Houston was the air conditioning capital of the world because it was so muggy there. And I got a true appreciation for that when I visited. And I, you know, I, um, I, I'm very glad to have documented this. Maybe there's a book to be written just about the genesis of the cult 45s. Uh, so, you know, there have been books about other things as well, but there, there's, there's a lot there that I wasn't able to cover uh, from the construction of Colt Stadium, lots of inside information, back, you know, background information that I, that I found about, uh, about the genesis of the team and the Houston Sports Association. 
th there's there's a lot there that unfortunately couldn't make it into the book. Oh, David. Uh, yes. I recall in 1962 that the uh, Houston Club, I mean, they, they finished to leave the head of the Cubs. Right. Uh, and the Mets. And the Mets. And the but Mets. The, uh, toward the end of the season, I recall that the Astros played the Giants and the Dodgers in, in uh, season ending series and took some important games to both clubs. That actually forced a playoff in 1962. Right. They're, 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 right. There's a lot, like I said, that, that just for time and space reasons couldn't get to. Uh, the Colt 45s won, I believe, 64 games that year. And Harry Kraft was the manager. I, I, I think there's a lot there, as I said, for, for other researchers uh, down the road to, to mind because they, they were a bit of a spoiler. Yeah. So, David, when you did your research on the Mets, um, how did they arrive at um, Casey Stengel as the manager? Well, Casey was, was he the first and only choice, or were there more? Casey, Casey was a marquee factor. It, it was really that. He was 70 years old. He, did, he wasn't managing Bauer and Mantle and Vera anymore. I mean, he, these were the Mets. These were cast-offs. Some of these players only had one year in the majors, 62. For some, it was their last year in the majors. So it, he was there at almost as a, he was a New York figure. And people of a certain age in New York will remember that he was a Brooklyn player. He played in, in the 1910s in Brooklyn. So some, some guy who's in his 70s taking his grandkids to, to the polo grounds you know, could say I saw Stengel play uh, the same way you know, people of my parents' generation remembered Billy Martin playing for the Yankees when we were watching him on television and, and managing uh, the World Series uh, champs in 77 and 78. And, and, and he's also reflected in the marketing. I mean, Ryan Gold Beer, he's all over those advertisements. So he, he's a known quantity, he's a known factor, he's lovable. Uh, I think Casey and Yogi are probably the two most beloved figures ever in baseball. I'd be hard pressed to, to find somebody to uh, be in that upper echelon. Who did the radio broadcasting for the Mets? It was Ralph Kiner, Bob Murphy, and Lindsey Nelson oh for years, for years. I mean, certainly when I was growing up in the late 70s, they were still the team. At least on WOR television, they were. Hey, David, I had a question for you. Uh, yes. Doing research, um, I, I see you used a lot of uh, oral interviews, interviews yeah. that you did. And uh, I, one of the quotes that I found was just like gold is when you interviewed... Uh, Thomas Schlamm? Is that, oh, is that Tommy, his name? Tommy Schlamm, yeah. Yeah, he was a uh, Houstonian, and he he uh, went on to uh, produce shows like uh, Sport Night, The West Wing, and things like that. And there's one, one quote here that you have in here, and he says, but he grew up in Houston. When the Astrodome opened in 1965, everyone wanted to go to Astros games. It gave Houston a stronger identity and national attention. We felt like we were the city of the future. The Mets seem like the stepchildren of the Yankees. Right. They sort of consumed a loser identity with a 40 and 120 record in their first season. So did you actually interview Tommy in New Yeah, I, I, I reached out to Tommy's uh, company and he was going to be in New York. And I uh, met him uh, downtown at a very small bistro and came with my laptop. And he generously gave me an hour of his time. He was the fastest in getting the release back to me. The, the, these publishers make you get a release for the interviews. And some interviewees drag their heels. I got it back from him, I think, either that day or the next day. It was emailed back to me by his assistant. Uh, he, was, he, he was great. He, he was a true fan. He talked about growing up in Houston and how big a deal it was when 
the Colt 45s were coming. And uh, I, I was just so happy that I was getting someone who was there. I, I'm, I'm just tired of, you know, interviewing historians or people who weren't there. I, I want someone who was 10 years old when they played, uh, you know, when, when, you know, who, the, you know that you, George Will, the great political columnist and analyst, he's also a great baseball historian. He says the best players are the ones who played when you were 12 years old. So I, you know, when you're in, when you're writing about 62, I want people who were born in the late forties and early fifties to share those, uh, those memories. Yeah, good. And I can tell you is that now that you mentioned that, when I was a young boy, my hero was Richie Ashburn. Yeah. And, and he hit 306 for the Mets in 1960. Right. And then he retired. Right. <laughs> Can't beat that. Did the, uh, did the Mets play in Shea Stadium in 62? Or they Shea, they was, Shea, was built, uh, Shea was built and debuted uh, in 64. So it was built a couple of years, and then it, it was 64 when it debuted, and the Polo Grounds went into the dustbin of history. So what that single was in John McGraw's old office, is that right? What's that? Stingle, Casey Stingle, the Mets manager. Oh, I didn't, it's actually I didn't in John know. McGraw's old office. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. What kind of shape was the polo grounds in then? Uh, playable, but I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it certainly wasn't what it was, you know, in the 20s. And then the stadiums just weren't made as uh, as as well back then. Yeah. Ebbets was certainly deteriorating by the mid-50s. How did the Mets draw in their first season in New York? I don't think they drew too well. I'd have to go back and do the research specifically, but there was a lot of fun about it. And I, I've said this before, if you come to New York and you go to a Yankees game and you take the six train, when you get off that six train, the subway train, uh, it's silent. Yankee fans walk with their shoulders back and their chests out and they expect to win. And it's been that way ever since Babe Ruth came to New York. It was that way in the twenties. It was that way in the fifties. It was that way in the seventies. It's that way now. When you get off the seven train in Queens, right outside city field, you don't have a foot off the subway train before people are chanting, let's go Mets. It's just a, a more fun, boisterous atmosphere. And it's very much like what I understand the Dodgers were, were, were like to root for in Ebbets Field. It was a, a, Don Drysdale described it in his autobiography that it was a carnival. It was a carnival atmosphere. Anyone else? Question? So the book is available now? The book is right it's here. Available, yeah, it's available on Amazon. Right, uh, right uh, now, I, I think there's a 50% discount, but I have no word on, on how long the discounts last. Uh, if you want to wait and buy it in Baltimore, uh, I know it'll be available at the Nebraska table. So I'll gladly sign it. Well, uh, those of us who will be there next month, we are looking forward to uh, meeting you in person, baby. Like I really like it. I, really I like appreciate it. that. So, Thank you. And, and let me just ask what, what I uh, make a request. Uh, if you read the book, uh, please consider writing a review on Amazon. Uh, those okay. reviews, those reviews are incredibly helpful for authors and publishers. Okay. I, I will certainly do that. David. Yes. Uh, Mike, I said, Mike yes. Trust. Yes. Certainly good to see you again. Likewise. That was a lot of fun prepping you up for that first bit. <laughs> yeah, you, you were you were you were definitely a, a calming paternal influence. You know, it's really it's one thing to get the it's one thing to get the winning bid. It's okay. one thing to go out there and do it. But the two hours that you're waiting, it was just 
it was interminable. It, it was just, I, I, I mean, it was just horrible, the waiting. So, uh, so David, what's next for you? Well, right now I'm working on a book about 1966, and that will be published in April by Roman and Littlefield. And uh, it's now in the hands of the editors. So it's going through copy editing and layout. I'm also working on two books. One is a cultural history of the Red Sox. And the other is a biography of Bo Belinsky, who's covered in the 1962 book. But I became fascinated with his life story. Uh, and I decided to pursue it as a biography. Okay. Where do you live then? I'm in Jersey City. All right. You going to do that book on the 62 Astro? Uh, it's possible. I, 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 it's possible. I, I think there's a lot of material. If it's not me, it'll probably be someone else in the next few years. There, there's a Thank great you, story. Sir. There's a great Houston story in getting that team. And couple that with you know, some something that's underscored in the book, uh, you, you mentioned the Tommy Shlami quote about the city of the future. Well, NASA having Houston in the byline of every space story in the world certainly raised Houston's visibility. So that combined with Major League Baseball really pushed Houston to the next level of uh, commerce, sprawl, people moving there, creating an industry, et cetera. Um, all right, Dave. Thank you. Thank Great you. Day. Be well. Take care. Okay. Next, uh, next up, coming to the plate, oh, President Emeritus. <laughs> <laughs> Bob has some interesting stories about his time when he was a little league coach. Some very interesting stories. If you uh, now, Bob told these stories at Sacred Day in America. Unless you have some new ones that you're telling tonight. So uh, some stuff really surprised a lot of people in that room. And I was really surprised. So uh, if you missed Saber Day in America back in February, shame on you. Don't ever miss another one. <laughs> so here is Bob. Take it away, sir. One last comment. I don't know if David's still listening. But I remember so well when I took him out, threw out the first pitch. And Mike will tell you, he was extremely nervous. Oh, man. So he went out there and he threw the first pitch. He, he came off the field. He says, you know what? That's the most fun I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I want to do it again next year. If we can do it. Um, Joe had me to talk for a couple minutes about uh, my experience as a Little League coach. Now, that's the Little League rules, which is just like the major league rule. Details are unbelievable. Uh, and I, we follow those rules to the chief. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, I received a phone call uh, from a good friend of mine who says, hey, there's a little league team available in our area. Would you like to manage it? And I thought for about 30 seconds said, sure, why not? Uh, and so it was an existing team where the Previous manager had been transferred. We had our own little ballpark, which was gorgeous. There were two ball fields, a softball field and a regulation field. And, uh, took care of those fields, so we never had to worry about getting in line or drag or anything. It was a perfect situation, a very nice area with a babbling brook coming between the two ballparks. Uh, in Little League back in those days, you were assigned a territory of about 25,000 people. That was your territory. So it's by, by streets, by highways, or whatever. And that's where you got your ball players. Um, our league was even more in particular in that we divided our area up into eight different areas. 
going to be an eight different team. It's part of this is because we didn't want players have to travel too far. Their parents have to travel too far to get involved. What year were you? 1967. And uh, so the first year, we had Jerry Manrich. No, but they did check birth certificate and address is very close. We had to turn in those when we turned in our roster. Nobody back at that point did what they did in New York a couple of years ago. Like, oh, 17 year old girl, or whatever it was. <laughs> um, Little League says that your roster can only have seven 12 year olds and six 11 year olds. You can have a roster of 15, but you can have no more than 12 who are uh, no more than seven who are 12 years old. And so basically, you kept your team for two years, you kept the 11 and the 12, uh, and you coached that for two years. I figured that. Probably, I coached 45 different players during my six years as a manager. Never did I dream that we'd have five of our players who would get baseball scholarships to uh, colleges. We'd have an All-American baseball player. We'd have a baseball player who went to the World Series on a winning team. And we had another player who was a two-time All-Pro football player. It was, Greg asked me, how did we do? Did we win any games? <laughs> yeah, we won some games. <laughs> we had the talent. I didn't know that when I took over this responsibility. All these people just came from about 3,000 3, homes, and uh, they love to play baseball. And uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the players that I coached. Uh, the first one you should all know. Um, That's the first team I ever coached. And right in the middle, right here, is an 11-year-old. There's a young man who played left field for us. His name was White Clark. Okay. Oh, the Chesh. The Chesh. The Chesh. Chesh. If you haven't seen it, I've got a pretty good scrapbook on Mr. Clark. And this picture has appeared in Sports Illustrated, Major League, uh, National Football League publications. Forever in a day, it kind of made what he into what he was. A uh, really cool guy, excellent guy. I remember his dad, he pitched for us as a 12 year old who pitched, and his dad could not watch him pitch, could not literally watch. He stood behind the dugout. That's our, our dugout. Batter. He stood behind the dugout. He watched home plate. He could see what the batter was doing, and he could see what the umpire was doing, but he could not see his son's pitch. And as soon as the player hit the ball, he come he come around the course. Bah, what happened? <laughs> yeah, it was hysterical, you know. Saying, well, so anyway, we were fortunate enough to win a championship, and uh, he invited us over to his house for champagne dinner. White's father. It was very nice. His dad was a major uh, banking executive. Uh, they said, uh, "Let's go to next year." Smoking. Yeah, that's amazing. Dwight was all everything in high school. He was a quarterback. He was a forward on the basketball team. He was also an outstanding athlete in the track team. But one thing I'll never forget and love him for is he's the only player that I coached in the six years who came back and agreed to umpire our games. So that's a picture of Dwight Clark. Not a good picture, but that's Dwight Clark. And he had such a reputation because he was always in the newspaper. They're writing him up and his dad, his family. The kids idolized him. They loved him. You know, look who's over in our ball game. Clyde Clark. And he was a good umpire, too. And he had a great personality, a terrific personality. And uh, very nice to that. He went on to Clemson University. One of the many pictures I have of him in high school, he's an HR article about the great Clyde Clark. Great personality. Dwight went on to Clemson University, got a uh, football scholarship to Clemson, and had a so so college career. Uh, he was hurt all the time, and his senior year, he only caught 12 passes. But he had a roommate named Steve Fuller. Now, 
Steve Fuller uh, was drafted in the first round from Clemson by the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. Right. And uh, he uh, he played for Kansas City, then he played for the Chicago Bears, and they led the Chicago Bears to a uh, world championship. Uh, and they went back to Kansas City. But while he was in Clemson, Bill Walsh, the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers, in those days would come out and interview players personally. So Bill Walsh came on the Clemson campus. And he said, I'd like to see you throw a few, throw, throw the ball. You have somebody that can catch some of your passes. And Steve said, yeah, my roommate's not too bad. I'll get him to come down. <laughs> so Dwight Clark went out. And they went through their paces and they took through passes. Nothing else was said. Okay. Then he was drafted. And in the 10th round of that draft, Dwight was selected by the San Francisco 49ers. He was thrilled to death to receive a contract for $400,000 over four years. That was big money back in those days. And uh, then he read the fine print. And there's a little picky to buy a print. The contract was for $100,000 a year for four years, which is still good money. But you had to make a team. You didn't make a team? Uh, Dwight made a team. <laughs> uh, this will take, we'll get to this in a minute. This is, this is a picture he sent to me. I got pictures. Uh, he started for the 49ers. Of course, their quarterback was Joe Montana. And he didn't do very well first five games. And they threw him a pass or he didn't play many plays. But he came to New Orleans to play against the Saints. And it just so happened that my company had season tickets for the Saints. And I was able to get a ticket to go to the ball game. So uh, make a long story short, a friend of mine who knew that I knew Dwight said, well, why don't you get together with Dwight after the game? I said, how would I do that? He said, I'll call him up. And see if he'll meet with you. You call him up? Yeah, I know where the chief stays. They stay at the Holiday Inn out of the airport. But I'll call him. So I called him at call the hotel. And the front office guy said, hey, we're under strict instructions. Under no way can we connect anybody to any of the players. Can't be done. So my friend said, well, let me say this. He said, a very good friend of Mr. Clark is here in the world and would love to see him. I think he would love to see this guy. Would you do us the favor to drop a note, White Clark, and tell him that Bob Norell would like to see him after the ball? And here's the telephone number I'm calling him. Five minutes later, I get a phone call from White. And he's thrilled to death to have somebody that's a friend. I mean, he's, he, he's struggling a little bit. Well, it just so happened that game, he caught five passes. I, I, he was on his way. And we did meet after the game. Uh, he said, well, let's meet by the buses. There are four buses out behind the Superdome. So I went out there, waited for a while. And I said, oh, just, he's already gotten on the bus. I was too late. Guy had stalled. So I got on the first bus, and some guy in the front seat said, said sir, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm looking for Dwight Clark. He said, I'm looking all around. He said, no, he's not on the bus. So I said, thank you. And I looked who I was talking to. No, Montana. O.J. Simpson, for second person. Should have thrown off the bus, there you are. So we met, uh, had a nice chat. And uh, we did that for a number of years. While we were still in New Orleans, we would meet after a game. He was just the most outgoing, most pleasant guy you could imagine. Uh, we, st we stayed in contact over the years. Uh, this is a picture of the he said to me, uh, thanks. I can read that to you. It's kind of self-serving, but it's, I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> Coach Burrell, thanks for making me the, the kind of athlete as well as the kind of person I'm proud to be. I'll never forget the days under your leadership. Right, Clark. Pretty nice. Oh, nice. Very nice. So, Did he stay with baseball at all after his game? No, he didn't. He, didn't. he, he left. <laughs> Strictly football. Uh, 
She had a pretty good enough. Like, I still put her on baseball, but I don't know better. She can list what it was. She's got a record. He said a record for the high school long term. And uh, so we do, we do that jump. That's that he can turn down. So this is the famous picture. Gets Dallas when 49ers qualify to go to the uh, Super Bowl. This is a Dallas play. Out of the There's some walls. He still remember it. Never still remember it. I mean, it's Dallas. It's just Rose to I never liked them until. <laughs> Funny thing happened because of this catch, this notoriety, he was picked to be a judge in the Miss Universe comedy. <laughs> he didn't know why I picked, but he said he's glad to do it. <laughs> so, anyway, he did judge. And the winner was a girl named uh, Sean Weatherly. She was Miss Universe. And believe it or not, they took up. They became a couple. And they couldn't go anywhere without getting their pictures taken. The got come, stole up the way, come and join them. And they were together get about two years. That kind of broke up. Here's some more pictures of white. I've got, you know, a dozen of them like this. Go ahead. Yeah. Here's the letter he wrote to me after he retired. Uh, I still like to be missing around now. I'm over, I'm over 30. And it's just, you know, very nice letter. He went into the restaurant business, the insurance business, and uh, when he retired. And uh, he's also in the memorabilia business. Uh, nice letter. Clark. That's one of his baseball cards. Football. Good looking guy. Should be a double. You're missing. And. Dwight got onto the pro circuit of signing memorabilia. And oh, we moved to uh, Houston. Just how much and, uh, he stopped playing. And so I decided, you know, I had, I, I should have brought, I had a very first order. We won that championship the very first year we played Little League Baseball. I had all the kids sign baseball. Now, this first order, I still have one. So, uh, Anyway, I wanted to get a helmet signed by point. And I happen to have that helmet right here. And if you know, he signed it, and he also wrote on here, the catch. Because that was the famous for him. I that would. I'll pass that around if anybody wants to take a look at it. But what was kind of cute about it was if you've ever been to these autograph shows, you know, the players sit at a table. He's got a handler right next door to him who accepts the tickets and lines up the, the ball or whatever to be signed just right. And they hand it to the player. And the player signs it. A lot of the players just sign wait for the next one. You know, not too much of their personal contact. Well, Dwight wasn't that way. He always looked at the person he was signing for. And that one show his hand. He shake their hand, that kind of thing. So going through, I, I get right in front of Dwight. You see one of these, oh, you're here. Come on, Graham. Yes, I am. He said, that's awesome. And I said, I, he, he jumped up on the table and he came around to, to the front. People said, lining up with other audience. He says, hey, everybody, here's my little league coach. I want you to see him. <laughs> and I happened to have a kid in a little league uniform. And I gave him his little league uniform and he was thrilled to death. I don't know how I fit into it. He was a quick, pretty small guy at the beginning, but I gave this. Uh, sadly, Dwight's uh, no longer with us. Uh, as you probably know, he got ALS. Uh, uh, he went very, he went 15, 15 months. And DiBartolo became very close with. The owner of Ford's, and he thought White was he treated him like a son. And uh, as soon as Ed found out White was suffering, he had his number retired in the SM and uh, at the uh, 49th football stadium. And uh, as he deteriorated a little bit, 
I asked him, Blake, what can we do for you? What would you like to do? He said, I'd like to have one last reunion with my teammates. And he did. But uh, he uh, lives in Montana, that's on ranch in Montana. And he brought all his teammates out of the like, you know, in a wheelchair, can't talk, but he can smile. When Dwight passed, uh, Mr. DiBartolo asked for permission to bury Dwight on his grounds. He had a football field that he had built as a stellar. He wanted to bury Dwight into a family city. Yes. So, uh, Bob, how old was he? Was he uh, 61? He was 61 years old, not 19, I mean, 2018. Bob, well, do you think it was football related? You know that? Uh, probably not. I think it was a disease. It wasn't like a dementia or something. Really. I mean, I don't know. It's speculated. But anyway. So that's my story about Mr. Clark. Super human being, super person. You know, he sent me letters, sent me Christmas cards, all that kind of stuff. He kind of followed up. Now we have another player that Mr. Smith is aware of. And this is a fellow by the name of Mark Davis. Now he may not be a household name to you. Uh, Mark, this little guy right here. And he played shortstop for us. His dad had played minor league baseball for eight years, Giants organization. And Mark came out, and of all the kids that I had for six years, he's by far the best athlete. Just a super man. Why? I'm assuming, but he could play the game. And uh, you, you can see we had some guys pretty good size, and then we had these little guys. This is another one of our better teams. Great. I'd like to let you know. So, uh, he was drafted. Uh, oh, yeah. One interesting thing is his dad liked to umpire our inner squad games when we were practicing. And he always was standing behind home plate. He would stand behind the pitch. He'd be behind home plate. And anytime a striker, he said, Striker, striker. That's what you remember people who talk to me <laughs> like that. Nice guy. Uh, White went to the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Mark, not far, I'm sorry. Like, yeah, Mike. Uh, and then he transferred uh, to Thompson. And he was signed in the uh, 11th round by the Twins in 1982. And he was converted, like Terry Profess, he's converted to a uh, outfielder. He was playing shortstop through high school. But, and I don't know if he has to a scout or not. I'll tell you that. Probably. He played uh, in Orlando because he came up with player of the year in Orlando. And then he went up to the Twins. And uh, unfortunately, well, he played uh, 413 games in his six year career, but he becomes a 26 man on a 25 man roster. And so he's up and down quite a bit. Uh, but he did get into the World Series, he had two at bats in the World Series. He was a defensive replacement many times for the tournament. And you can, there is the World Championship 1987, Minnesota Twins. Kirby Bucket. Kirby Bucket on the right hand side. Second, second from the end, lines up here in the corner. Uh, he took his World Series wins, and uh, I don't know what they were, but I guess they're seventy eighty thousand dollars back then. And he bought a farm, State School, North Carolina. They retired to it in playing age. Oh, I happen to have his batting jersey. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I have, I do. This is not his, this is the note I have. But I do have his batting jersey. Okay, I have a lot of jersey. Uh, then he was traded to the Astros. And he played six years with the Astros. And just to show you a couple pictures, in 19, 
I'm going to say 81. Sports Illustrated published every player's salary. Release. Just like this. And there's Mark right here. Two of our baby. What? 625. Yeah. For every player. Right, let's see. I have page after page after page, which I thought was interesting. Well, that, Bob, wasn't that probably your maybe tell you remember that, that minimum back then, 62 five? Uh, in what year, 1981? Yeah. Question. Uh, the minimum salary. I, I, I don't, I don't recall. I can show you what's out. Eighty-one was in the round. Yeah. yeah. You can see how good a player is. But here he is on the front page. Oh, he's 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 on the one of the page of, of the Astros uh, yearbook. You know, Bagwell, Biggio, Caminetti. Tim the Shays, Mark Davis. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's how you realize that. Go ahead. Here are the salaries. Uh, 1990. 1990. Uh, here's opening day salaries. You take a look and see what some of our players were making. Mark got up $300,000. Thank you, Dal. It's more than Vichy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but usually you're 11 or 12. You then it cuts off and go to, in our area, you go to Bay Roos, which is full field. That's the big field, yeah. Actually, no, I played for my six, well, the majors were 11 to 12, then they had minors to <laughs> provide. Nine and ten year olds, and uh, then the Peewees were seven and eight. But uh, I, was, I was gonna ask you that was like a 1939 Little League thing you had up there first. I thought Little League started right after World War II. You know, I know Joey J was 1977. Is this year, but I was involved with it. My brother, 96, 1939, World War II. That's not real. Okay, but I, I didn't realize when they started that early in 39. I thought it started up in World War II. No, I think it was it was, it was around. It went all over the country to start in Pennsylvania. Remember, I had a baseball card about Joey Jay with the yeah. 1960 card. He was the first little leaguer to make majors play. Yeah. So, pick eight yeah. years off that, yeah. it'd be about like yeah. And we, our league was official, was part of, you know. In fact, we could take an all star team and start playing toward the Little League World Series. No, I, I know Little League has been going on since then. I was just wondering what yeah. that means. A lot of people call that League Little League. Well, did you ever coach one of the all star teams? Yes. The winning coach or manager got to take the all star team. I couldn't always do it because of my job responsibilities, because, you know, regular season is three days a week, all stars is six days a week. <clears throat> That would go over. But I did, yes. Didn't have a too friend well. of mine in uh, a networking group from the, it's about 98, 99. He took the team all the way to the final. And his youngest son is now Will Best, named Matt Best. Will been bouncing up and down, but he's with Detroit now. Went to Seattle and came yeah. back. He played in his second year with the Troy. Looks like he's going to stick this test. Went to Seattle, got married. His wife got out there. He back to Detroit. But his wife's a school nurse. Well, just a quick aside that little area we had, I said there were five teams, uh, five, eight areas, two, one for each team. And we had three other players beside my players who made it to the major leagues from our little area in Charlotte. Uh, yeah. One guy named Rick Smith, who played for the White Sox. Another was Brian Little, who was a shortstop, who played for the White Sox, the Yankees, and the Expos, and was an outstanding bludger. In fact, was hired after his professional career to uh, be a, a bunny coach. And the last, and his brother, who you may remember, is Grady Little, who yep. managed the uh, Red Sox and the Dodgers. And, of course, his name is still controversial in Boston because they pulled Pedro Martinez. So, you know, the playoffs. And Pedro still says Grady made the right decision to pull him. But I told him 120 pitches. I was spent. I did not need to be out there. I like Ricky. Anyway. No? One other thing, uh, Trump. It's kind of ironic because I coached a guy that uh, Dwight Clark's roommate uh, was a uh, his teammate on the San Francisco 49ers. He was a defensive back named Johnny Jackson. He played at the University of Houston. He was an All American defensive back, and so he was on that 49er team. Yeah. Look at all these connections. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought you know, it would be the all time receiver for 49ers. Then some it's guy named nice. Jerry Rice came along. <laughs> <laughs> and then Rice was. All right, Bob. Thank you. Again. All right, Maxwell. Yes. Here's the thing. Uh, Maxwell is going to give the uh, trivia, but you're not here. So uh, there's not any paper around here, but I have plenty of paper here for anybody that wants to uh, participate. I don't remember. Uh, I didn't even think about that until I was looking at your smiling face, Maxwell. So, oh my God, you're in Canada. No, you're not looking at my smiling face anymore. <laughs> so, who would like to? Uh, or I have some paper for if y'all want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got something. 
Topic tonight is baseball in the history of the state of Maryland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of uh, a little bit of sharpening, a little bit of sharpening your pencils for the. All right. Wait a minute. It's got that one that's messed up from last time. It says all the animation. Give me one second. Sorry, sir. One day I'm going to remember. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what question are we on? One. All right. What member, what was the first member of the modern Baltimore Orioles to be enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame? So that's 1954, the present. What was the first member, or who was the first member of the modern Baltimore Orioles to be enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame? And he was later a Houston Astro. I'm going to go on to question two. Yeah. All right. The American and National Leagues first began to award the most valuable player in 1931. The first three American League MVPs were all born in the state of Maryland. Name them. It's not sharing. Really. It's not sharing. Hold on a second. Tell him actually slow down. Very close. Hold on a second. Chris is trying to do something. Trying to get share. Hold on a second. Baseball and history in the state of Maryland? Yeah, all, every one of my questions has some relationship with the state of Maryland, and I don't repeat any correct answer. So you're not going to hear the same correct answer more than once. First member of the modern Baltimore Orioles to be enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame. That was. Do you want the answer now? No, no, we're not. We're... That's the one. That's the one. There's number two. Number, number two, the American National League oh. first began to award the most valuable player in 1931. The first three American League MVPs were all born in the state of Maryland. Name them. Still need more time? Or you want me to go to number three? Number three. Number three. Number three. All right. Who won the American League batting title in 1924? And your clue is baseball in the state of Maryland. Her response is the same as her. So, I'm going to play the game. I'm going to play the game. I'm going to play the game. I'm going to play the I was next to the game. This is PhD, though. <laughs> <laughs> number four Max? number four there were four members of the 1994 baltimore orioles who are now in the hall of fame who are they four players who are now in the hall of fame four. Yeah, all 
already to go to the research. I can go to the start. That's usually the one question that I need to Wait, Oh, four Yeah, I'll take it there. Wait, I'll show you. We'll say it. You ready for number five? Ready for number five. What five What five Negro League players in the Hall of Fame played for Baltimore teams? I'm going to love you, but... Five Negro League players in the Hall of Fame played for Baltimore teams. Number six is easier. Number six. I, I, I think I think this is the most difficult question. Number six. Which player, born in Baltimore, achieved his 3,000th hit in Baltimore? And off which pitcher did he achieve his 3,000th hit? I wouldn't say any words. Born in Baltimore. Born in Baltimore. It's not too bad. I think I said it was false. Sure. Don't worry. Anybody else want to look at it? Yeah. Sun is in. Go. I've already bought my copy of Amazon. Huh? I've already bought my, my, my copy of the book. What book? Yeah, it is 50% off. Yeah. Last well, so year, we got $60. Yeah. Number seven. Number seven. All right. In 1996, a book was written about two well known Orioles personalities entitled Together We Were 11 Foot Nine. Who were the personalities? So the is just good. Who's that? Oh, Goodell. Right franchise. <laughs> Great. All right, so number eight. What team did the 1901 Baltimore Orioles eventually become? And what teams eventually became the 1954 Baltimore Orioles? Orioles. <laughs> Don't 
Carl, I'm timing off you because when you're done, we're all done. You're, you're the, there were nine. All right, name name every player in the Orioles Yankees blockbuster trade of 1976. So there's lots of points up for grabs in this one. Ten points. Hey, John. I just let the reports on both teams, you'll eventually get to see that in English. You're working these people all pretty good tonight, Michael. Sorry. I see some, I see some grimaces and some shaking heads. And That's more than tears, I see. Tears. Ready to move on or are you still ready, working? Ready for number ready. 10? Yeah. Who is Marilyn married to? Who was the state of Maryland married to? Uh, the person the state of Maryland was or married. That's illegal. Probably one of King Henry. It is Next. Yeah. Is that it? That's One it. More. That's you it. Got a tiebreaker. You got a tiebreaker question. You want to do We're that good. now? You want to do the tiebreaker? You want to see if there's a tie first? Let's do the tiebreaker. All right. How, okay. Name the only Orioles World Series MVP who's not in the Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. Hey, Ernest. Stole from a friend's house. All right. Bye. All right. So, the first member of the modern Baltimore Orioles being enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Anybody? Robin Roberts. Robin Roberts, Robin Roberts is correct. Paul Richards. He's not in the Hall of Fame. All right. The American League and National Leagues first began to award the most valuable player in 1931. The first three American League MVPs were all born in the state of Maryland. Name them. Anybody? Baker Fox. Jimmy Fox. Jimmy Fox is correct. That's one of the answers. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth's incorrect. Uh, Lefty Grove. Lefty Grove's correct. And can anyone name the third? Frank Robinson? No. Not 1931. All right, you've already named it. Was Jimmy Fox won it a second time? <laughs> so if you, got, if you said Lefty Grows, you, you get one point. If you said Jimmy Fox, you get two points. <laughs> Somebody on uh, Yankees Twitter once said about the Kyle Tucker play trying to steal home. That was kind of bushy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a great play. I thought it was too. That was great. American League batting title in 1924. The Sultan of SWAT. You got it. Batted 378 for his only batting crown in 22 years in the major leagues. 
the four members of the 1994 Orioles in the Hall of Fame? Eddie Murray. Incorrect. Eddie Murray was on, Cle Eddie Murray was on Cleveland. Anybody else? Palmer. Yeah. Mike Messina. Mike Messina is correct. That's one. Holy cow. Cal Ripken. Cal Ripken's two. And we got two more. Jim Palmer. No, he was retired. One was a big, tall relief pitcher. And the other was a designated hitter with a beard. A designated hitter with a beard. Eddie Murray? No, for the third time. Already, said that. already eliminated Eddie Murray. So, because I said Eddie Murray first. Were you sleeping again? <laughs> Eddie Murray is still incorrect. Good <laughs> button. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was Lee Smith and Harold Baines. Lee Smith wasn't a designated hitter. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Smith could have been a designated hitter. He was a pretty good hitter when he was a pitcher for the Cubs. And Lee Smith and uh, Harold Baines. Harold Baines. What, five Negro League players in the Hall of Fame who played for Baltimore teams. Satchel Page. No. No. Roy Campanelle. Roy is correct. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Who said Eddie Murray? Nope. Josh Oscar Gibson. Charleston. Josh Gibson. Josh Gibson. Incorrect. Cool Papa uh, Bell. Cool Papa Bell. Cool Papa cool. Bell. Not Cool Papa just, Bell. Does that look like him? <laughs> All right. The other the others were Ray Dandridge, Leon Day, Biz Mackey, and Willie Wells. Ray Dandridge. Who are and, they? And Eddie Murray is not a correct answer to any question in this case. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're ready for you must hate Eddie Murray. All right, the three thousand hit guy. Al Taylor. Correct. And who did he hit it off? The big the squad. <laughs> Left-handed pitcher won twenty games. Big Oh, Boyar. Cuban turtle. Mike Boyar. Didn't win the Cy Young Award, so that eliminates Quayar. Is, same, sorry, isn't Andy Messersmith, but Dave McNally. McNally. Correct. Dave McNally's correct. Number seven. Together we were 11 foot nine. Who were they? Weaver and Palmer. Weaver and Palmer. You got it. Oh, Weaver boy. was 5'6". Palmer was 6'3". Number eight. So what, team, what team did the 1901 Baltimore Orioles become and what teams eventually became the 1954 Baltimore Orioles? The Highlanders, Yankees, and Browns. St. Louis Browns. Yep. Highlanders or Yankees will take either. St. Louis Browns, I heard the correct answer. And, there were, and what team were the Browns before they moved to St. Louis? Milwaukee Brewers. Milwaukee Brewers is correct. Whoa. Now number nine, the uh, the blockbuster. <laughs> Ken Sigel. Scott McGregor. Tiffany Martinez. Rick Dempsey. Pat Dobson. Uh, how's he doing? Dobson's incorrect, but the others are all good. Reggie Jackson. No. Uh, oh, really? uh, it was a free agent. He did play some ball. Yeah. The Orioles actually would have done themselves a favor if they did trade him to the Yankees then. Terry Whitfield. Uh, 
I'm assuming there were 10 players or 10 points. There were 10 players. Five went to Baltimore. Five went to New York. I think we're seven short. Yep. Go ahead and name them off, man. Justin Adams? No, he was long retired by then. All right, but the, the the players who went to the Orioles were Rick Dempsey. Kenny Murray. Yeah. Oh, no. Rick Dempsey, Tippy Martinez, Rudy May, Scotty McGregor, and Dave Pagan. And the players who went to the Yankees were Doyle Alexander, Jimmy Freeman, Elrod Hendricks, Kenny Holtzman, and Grant Jackson. And the last question, who was Marilyn married to? King Henry. Chris George. King Charles. King Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> oh! That's <laughs> My my so little league coach asked Bob. My little league coach asked me the same question, and I didn't know the answer either. So there. All right, the only World Series MVP who's not in the Hall of Fame. Well, you want to see if we have a tie for Rick Dempsey. Rick Dempsey's yep. correct. So do we have? Uh, let's add up the points. Do we have? 15 points, anybody? Anybody with 15 points? Anybody with 15 points? We have 13 at this table. Who has 13? Our table. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And we got no points anywhere for Eddie Murray. <laughs> oh, we would have had 15 or 20. Our 20. You know what? Next, next time I do one of these, it'll be an Eddie Murray theme, and Eddie Murray will be the correct answer to every question. <laughs> we'll still get them all wrong. <laughs> Maxwell. Yeah. Maxwell. Why Maryland? Why Maryland? What? Why did you pick Maryland? Because the convention's going there next month. Anybody more than 13? Mike, looks like you're the winner. Our guys want to well work. done, Mike. All right. Uh, we used to do this when I first started. That was a prize for the winner. They got to split up the ball. Oh, I won. Congratulations, Mike. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Good. Wow. Why, tonight's... Uh, I deserve that for catching you in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about all the notes that I took in a book. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, again, we're not having a meeting next month. Uh, we're having a... Uh, well, kind of have a meeting if you want to go to the game. It might. Caps talked to us about it, put the grinder. He said he'd be happy to do it. So we'll have to get together probably an hour before the game. I'll try to get us the, uh, the meeting room. I had a restroom there upstairs at the uh, Race Cowboy Station. What is it? Spark Club Field? Champion Field? Mostly. Cotley. Okay. So as, uh, as soon as uh, Mike gets all that down, I'll, I'll send all the information out plus his address. Uh, yeah, Tom. Oh, well, I just want to bring something to the, uh, the attention group. There's one article in the journal uh, last week about something called the Miracle League, and it has to do with uh, um, a, a team that really it has disabled and autistic folks playing too many games, and uh, they're by other groups. And they can be old or young. But anyway, it's a very effective article. If you don't mind, I might write this up, send it around. If you ever were thinking of some sort of public service project. Yeah. You might be interested. Most definitely. Yeah, that's a good idea. I have a question. Was it last month? No, I missed. Uh, no. The, the, the guy that uh, goes and speaks, was he here speaking about Gary still? Yeah. The, the uh, memories program? program? Yeah, also, yeah, and yeah. it's been very successful yeah. in San yeah. Marcos. I think was the year you presented there, and uh, Bobby Brown spoke. He spoke about how successful he just started it. 
how much those people said there were people that wouldn't speak or do anything. They go in and talk baseball, and all of a sudden they were just that's right. They could remember from he wants us to start a uh, chapter here in Houston. Ago. So uh, you volunteering to turn up? No, I don't have the time. No, but it, I think it's a worthwhile project. It is. It is it's very worthwhile. Um. Anyway, I'll uh, I'll send out. Wonder if anything happened. Just talk. I'm asking our president for an update. But I haven't got any uh, responses from anybody that said they'd be interested in starting a you know, chapter here. I wrote wanted to know. So uh, the moment somebody wants to uh, volunteer, we can you can maybe start a chapter here. But like you said, we're all very busy. Right? But it is a worthwhile cause. By the way, how do people let's be asked for do the second half of the season? Well, if it's anything like the first half of the season, they'll do really great. And then toward the end, they'll sort of get real tired, <laughs> which is what they acted like the last three days. So uh, we'll see. Craig for a trade for Juan Soto. Yes. No. <laughs> I think one of the best things they did was not sign a rare with Hilton Right. Pena, we would be in Sugar Land. So if we signed Correa, then they wouldn't have had the money to sign Alvarez. That's so. right. Well, that's things work out better than they could do. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, those of you who are going to Baltimore, um, if I don't see you at the game, the first weekend of August, uh, maybe I'll see some of you in Baltimore. Uh, if not, the next time we will meet is Monday, September the 19th. Uh, same place, same time. Um, with Chris Rawls, the Portable Houston Museum guy. Till then, try to stay cool. Try to stay cool. Go ahead. Did y'all say anything? I didn't say anything. First week. All right. I'll see you in Baltimore. See you, see you in Baltimore, Joe. Oh, by the way, there's an excellent ceremony from the, from the Home Run Derby tonight with Albert Pujols. So you have a chance. Wait, what? What did he say? What did he say? I said there was an excellent. There was an excellent. Albert Pujols won his round. There was an excellent no. ceremony tonight about Albert Pujols at the uh, All Star Game. So, I mean, the home run thing still going on? Yeah, there's a there, there was a ceremony with where the, well, all the players were congratulating Pujols on his career. Wow! Oh, okay. It's television worth watching. Check that out. Thanks, right here. Right here.